Uh, but last couple of weeks, though, it has waned. I, I, I will have to say that it has. I suppose there were other issues that uh, the Brits wanted to get their teeth into. I suppose so. There were quite a few. But fortunately today, I'm quite sure their interest has peaked again. It's taken an incredible turn. And Chris, I'll come to you about the, the decision that was handed down by Judge Masipa. My panel yesterday was quite divided on the way she, she, uh, the way she would rule. What did you make of Judge Masipa's uh, reasoning and her final uh, d decision? Well, I think she got it right, as some of us predicted. We did say that she would have no option uh, but to make that ruling. What's important, David, is that we go back to the fundamental test. Justice must be done and seem to be done. That test can't be satisfied unless we know who did it and why. Mm. We all know who did it. Yes. At this stage, in day 32, is it? Yes. The record is over 4,000 pages long. We still don't know why. And um, I lamented this yesterday. Um, Oscar gave an explanation as to the why. I think there's general uh, agreement that at the very least, it's a highly, highly problematical explanation. I think a proper assessment of Oscar, and I think this is what the judge is in fact intending, a proper assessment of him is long overdue. Mm. Uh, so that the why, why he acted in this way, why he killed somebody, not being a violent person, not being a criminal, why he killed a beautiful young girl, can now be explained. In other words, we now have the best chance of knowing why he did it. Yes. It, it got raised now by a, a top psychiatrist who was called in at a very late stage. And he should this not have been done at an earlier stage of this trial? Well, if you remember, David, when you asked the panel and we started right at the beginning of this trial, I think quite a few of your panel members said to you, the first thing you do in a matter of this nature, get inside the person's head, get somebody who's got the expertise, find out, is there anything underlying, is there any problem, is there any mental problems, etc. Start from the very beginning, before you even see your client, so that you know when you see your client, what you're dealing with, yes. because you yourself don't know. Somebody who appears on the outside perfectly normal, a hero, highly regarded, Olympic gold medal winner, why would somebody act like that? You as an advocate will never ever know. The court probably won't even know. Go to the experts, get the psychiatrists, get the psychologists, get into his state of mind at the particular time, find out if there's anything, any medication, any alcohol involved, drugs involved, any psyche, any mental illness, defect, something from the past, then bring it to you, give you an interim report and say, right, before you consult, you must be aware this person has got an anxiety disorder, hypervigilant, certain problems that will affect his state of mind, whether or not he's guilty or not guilty, deal with it. That's what you do right at the very beginning before you even deal with your client. Um, I don't understand, but obviously, you know, you've got a very good defense team. I don't know why they came so late in the day. And as I've said before on the panel, when you've got a report, give it to the state, the same as they've given you theirs. Let the experts meet. Let them agree to agree, agree to disagree. Very, very simple. Come back and say, well, the point in issue is whether or not this disorder has affected the person's state of mind, whether he's culpable and liable in law for his actions. Okay. That's what it's about. Just to pick Can up you? on that, if I may, if it's... A lot of the debate has been, what's the motivation behind even making this application? I've seen a lot of tweets asking, but why do this? Mm. The reality of it is, justice indeed needs to be done. And the prosecution's responsibility and the prosecution's job isn't, we want to get this guy at all costs. The prosecution's job is, justice must be done. And if justice means somebody needs psychiatric supervision for the rest of their life, as a hypothetical, as a hypothetical, then it's the prosecution's responsibility to make sure that that particular option is available to the judge. Yes, Chris. A very important uh, aspect that the public needs to understand is that this might well actually benefit Oscar. It might actually lead to his acquittal. In other words, uh, the effect of the expert psychiatric and psychological uh, examination might support or prove the very defense that we imagine, we imagine that he is proffering and that is the defense of uh, putative private, private defense. defense. But 
Is he now raising another defence, a third defence, Manny? Because you've been involved in a number of cases. In fact, uh, Manny Witz has brought in the, the, uh, the judgments for us to read. And these are actually cases that haven't been cited uh, in court at all, but cast an incredible amount of light on this exact issue. That's this non-pathological cr criminal incapacity. And, uh, tell me a little bit more about I'll this, I'll tell you Manny. exactly about it, but I think first what the viewers need to know and they need to hear. Something that was very important, and I think the judge very carefully didn't include it in the judgment, because everybody seems to have missed what Oscar actually said. Okay, you've got and it. You've I've got, got it, and okay. I, I've got it, and I want to just read it okay, very, read very it. quickly, because thanks to Cliff Alexander and our slam dunk Professor Tucson, <laughs> brought it to my attention and said, well, have a look at this. Now that's why we know why the judge referred him. Because if this defense goes through, forget about Michelle Berger, forget about cricket bats, forget about yeah, dogs sounding like cats, forget about everything. If this defense goes through, not guilty, acquitted. And this is what he said in court. Now, is this under cross-examination? Under cross-examination. Okay. And this is word for word what he said said, I was afraid someone was going to start shooting. He added, I heard a noise from inside the toilet. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. There was ringing in my ears. The sprinter also told the court he was now on medication. Now that's obviously from a newspaper or that part. No, there. this is the transcript. This is exactly the, what he said in the court. The sprinter added, sorry. The I'd... sprinter. Where was that part of the testimony? In his evidence. Okay. They said, referred to him as the sprinter, the, the runner. Okay. Also told the court he was now on medication and suffered from panic attacks and held a long-held fear of crime, which he says contributed to him firing through the bathroom door. Then I heard a noise from inside the toilet, which I perceived to be somebody coming out of the toilet. Before I knew it, I fired four shots at the okay, door. So now, so that is sane automatism. That's exact, not temporary, <coughs> non-pathological incapacity. That's what he's saying. And Meryl Forster, who gave evidence, has tried to back him up on that. And if that evidence goes through and that defense stands, notwithstanding it wasn't raised, that's his evidence. That's what he told Harry Nell under cross-examination. It's on the record. If that evidence stands, you can forget about ballistics. You can forget about where the magazine rack was. You can take everything out of the case. Forget about... Um, the neighbours, you can forget about the standards, nobody counts in this case because the law is clear and this is how it works, it's actually very simple for the viewers there's two legs to it it means you're perfectly sane you haven't got a mental illness, you're not insane you cope every day, you function, you run you perform, you win gold medals you drive a motor vehicle, you work you perform, you train, you do everything fine something happens in your life and for that particular moment you can't distinguish in law between what is right and what is wrong. And that is the first leg. The second leg is that you haven't got sufficient restraint to control your actions. If those two legs are there, and that is what he's saying over here, I was in a trance. I was like a robot. I was but saying that obviously is you're not guilty and you're acquitted. But it's going to have to be very, very carefully scrutinized by the court. And I'm and going to go into what we'll how do. it is done and what our law is because we've got two appeal court judgments in front of us which talk about this. Exactly. It's a fascinating um, issue that Manny Witts has raised here. I'll get the views as well of Chris Greenland and Kanye Jele about this. You can join us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and WeChat by searching for Oscar Trial 199 later on in the show. We'll have a look at some of the tweets sent to our legal panel. We may well be answering some of those questions here and now, but uh, we'll mop up at the end of the show. We'll be back after the break.